welcome to this webinar with regards to how the batteries which are powering our lives and the products around us uh, can be better taken care of and how those products can be made uh, more easily repairable based on handling of batteries. My name is Rakesh Vazirani. I'm with Tovrainan and I have the pleasure of being the host and moderator for today's webinar. We have with us today a power packed lineup. We have uh, Ms. Mariana Davila, who's with Lund University, a researcher. She focuses on topic of circular economy and currently exploring ways of incentivizing repair. Also, we have John Pierre. She, he's the policy officer with uh, the European Environmental Bureau. We have then uh, Mr. Christian Eckert, who's with Zwei, the German Electro and uh, Digital uh, Industry Association. We, of course, then have the ringleader of the repair movement, uh, Mr. Kyle Points, and our battery expert, Jason Tang. Let's first have a look at um, where are our participants joining us today from. So what we see is from the about 195 registrants, we see there has been a lot of interest from, of course, uh, Asia, but equally from Europe uh, and the Americas. So thank you very much for taking the time. It must be late evening for many of you in Asia, like myself. Um, we appreciate it. Thanks for joining this dialogue and um, uh, sharing your feedback via the registration form. We also got an idea that you represent um, almost the entire supply chain where with there being brand retailers, consultants, manufacturers, uh, our peers from the third party testing inspection industry, but also industry association, repair service providers, uh, NGOs, uh, the standardization committee, and of course, recyclers. Thanks a lot. So it was interesting for us to understand what is the kind of products that you are dealing with. And uh, as with the title of the webinar and the focus, so it was clear that Many of you, of course, are dealing with uh, batteries, but also electronic products like household appliances, uh, toys, uh, ICT, and, and automotive products. Many of them are, of course, powered by batteries, uh, in many cases, uh, rechargeable. And uh, sometimes, after a period of time, these batteries of course, need to be uh, replaced to make sure the product reaches its optimum performance. And since the uh, focus is on sustainability aspects, we were interested to know if you all are using some sort of eco labels to differentiate the sustainability credentials or performance of your products. And this is what we understand that uh, many of you are using the EU eco label, but then for ICT products, we see you all have mentioned EPEAT, uh, there's a German Blue Angel, uh, the Nordics phone, TCO, and, and also other. Now, uh, going a step back, um, batteries, of course, have had a long history and They've helped our civilization and what we see here is how it started off and how it has been developing. And uh, at the moment, it's kind of on steroids with the rapid development and the overall electrification of everything that can be electrified. So that um, adds efficiency to our lives, that uh, opens up potential for decarbonization, but that also poses to us some important questions that need to be answered in terms of um, battery uh, maintenance, repair, uh, removability, and, and how it should be addressed. All of that, of course, is from the perspective of the EU Green Deal uh, on one hand, which has the Circular Economy Action Plan, which comes came out with the Sustainable Products Policy Framework, within which one of the focus categories is, of course, batteries. And the idea is overall, for, for products which are in scope, that it should be possible to repair, that spare parts should be available, and, and overall the impact of these products uh, on the environment uh, and the society in a negative way has to be uh, reduced and addressed. At the same time, we see the interlinked area of repairability, where there is, as you know, a, a repair index in France for certain product categories. The EU has its own proposal and how it will all fit in together uh, with the the Sustainable Products Initiative, and of course have also an impact on products which have battery. Now, with regards to the battery regulation or the proposed battery regulation, these are primarily the pillars, yeah? So there's this topic of 
having carbon footprint declaration for the battery products, uh, of course, the due diligence aspect also linked to the EU due diligence requirements that came out, the battery passport linked to the digital product passport, the possibility of uh, repurposing and, and repairing and replacing, and, and then, of course, reducing the impact on material use based on circular economy principles. But today, we will focus the discussion on Article 11, which is about removability and replaceability. Um, many of you are familiar with uh, the recent vote on this topic. And when the vote came out, and when, of course, this proposed regulation came out, there were already perspectives coming out from all relevant stakeholders. So industry associations have shared uh, their perspective on what are the aspects they feel will work out, what are the aspects that should be looked at uh, a little closer. But also the repair industry, repair sector, and the recycling sector has come out with uh, their perspective, with their comments, and with their suggestion. Now, as we start looking a little deeper and get a perspective from our experts uh, on the panel, uh, this is an interesting aspect where we asked you how many items have you repaired in the past couple of years? And, and what we see is about 40% of you mention uh, none and uh, about 40% mention less than five. So it would be interesting if you could type it in the chat. Uh, what were the reason that uh, you did not repair stuff? Was it because it was such great quality that it did not require mending or it was just not possible to mend because it was completely destroyed or you had other issues? Well, at the same time, we also asked you if you have come across some barriers in terms of replacing uh, uh, batteries or, or not being able to repair products. And what we see is an, a large proportion of you mentioned that it's uh, the challenge has been because there has not been enough technical information to safely replace batteries. You also mentioned that uh, you all felt that perhaps there are some risks that during repair um, and replacement, uh, maybe the device might get uh, damaged. And then we spoke, looked at uh, non-modular aspects or uh, lack of availability of spare parts and so on. And I think uh, Mariana and John Pierre, you will also reflect on this point. But before we start looking there, uh, Ryan, can we have the first poll question? And if our audience can provide their perspective uh, before we start getting a reflection and go through the interventions. So, with regards to the topic of battery replaceability and removability, what do you all feel? Do you all feel that it's not difficult, it's just complicated? Or do you all feel that um, it will almost always pose a risk to a non-technical user? Do you feel that it should be the norm? Or do you feel that it should be safely possible as long as, let's say, the user had access to uh, technical information? Or do you feel something differently? And if you do, then please use the chat box to share your perspective. What do you feel that is with regards to ensuring batteries being replaceable and removable? What is your feeling? Yeah? Um, please feel free to choose either one of the options that you see, or if there's something different or something in addition, then please use the chat box and uh, share your thoughts with uh, our experts so they be able to reflect on it. All right, Ryan, uh, Ryan uh, let's uh, maybe have a look at the poll results. 70% uh, have responded. So if we can have a look. All right, so we see that um, almost half of you have mentioned that it should be the norm. And uh, a quarter of you mentioned that it should be safely possible as long as user has access to technical information, where they also being uh, some of you have concern, a fifth of you have concern that it could pose a risk to a non-technical user. All right, with, uh, with that then, um, I would like to request uh, Mariana Davila and uh, John Pierre Schweitzer to, to share your perspective on what you have observed um, during your research uh, and what are your recommendations? Thank you, Rakesh. Let me go ahead and share green and uh, welcome everyone. Good morning, good evening, good afternoon, good night, depending on where you are in the globe. Uh, let's see. Wrong button. There you go. This go. Yes. Perfect. 
So let me get started. I would assume many people in the audience have heard anecdotal evidence or maybe experience firsthand that integrated batteries in consumer electronics have shortened the lives of the devices or the batteries themselves and also lower collection and recycling rates. Well, we, we heard that too, and we set out to collect evidence on really what's going on when it comes to batteries. And we came up with this study. Uh, in the next 10 minutes or so, Jean-Pierre and I are gonna share key findings from our report and also update you on the latest policy developments on this issue. But before we start, uh, Jean-Pierre is gonna briefly introduce you to the Right to Repair campaign in the European Union. Yeah, hello everyone, and thanks Mariana, and thanks to uh, TUV, Rhineland, and Rakesh for organizing the meeting today. So yeah, just to briefly uh, introduce you to uh, the Right to Repair Europe campaign, we are a uh, growing campaign started by the, the six organizations you see on the bottom there. Personally, I work for the European Environmental Bureau, which is the largest federation of environmental NGOs in Europe. But we're working together with uh, iFixit, who are represented by, by Kyle. Great to have him here today. A bit of a legend, I would say, in the world of uh, repair. Uh, Restart Project, who uh, organize uh, repair cafes across Europe and uh, other organizations who are really active in, in the area of repair and, and, and advocating for a right to repair. Um, what the campaign is about is really about focusing on, on the legislative act aspects of right to repair, thinking about spare part availability, access to information, the design of products, and how we can change laws in order that the, the products we, we own, love and use are, are easier to repair. We were really uh, interested when the, um, the proposal from the Commission on, on, on batteries uh, came out and, and we looked specifically at this Article 11, which uh, Rakesh already mentioned, and we wanted to yeah, develop some, some data and collect some evidence, uh, a lot of it from, from, our, from our partners in the campaign. I'll let Mariana present a bit more about the, the study and looking forward to your, your questions and the other presentations today. Thanks, Jean-Pierre. So let me start with a spoiler. We found no surprises in this report. Integrated batteries that are difficult or impossible to remove have become the norm for most consumer electronics. And this trend is shortening product lifetimes and is making and is decreasing the rates of collection and recycling. We actually calculated that difficult or impossible to remove batteries, specifically in tablets and phones in the EU alone will actually result in the unnecessary production of 39 million devices in 2030. This will cost almost 20 million euros and will result in life cycle carbon emissions that are equivalent to adding 1 million passenger vehicles to EU roads or providing electricity to 1.4 million homes in the EU for an entire year. In the report, we documented all these issues that are relating to the impacts I, I just mentioned, but uh, today we're going to talk to you about three. The first issue is a trend that started in 2010 to go from using standardized batteries and reversible joining techniques such as pull tabs, clips, and screws switching using customized batteries and adhesives and solder. You can see these trends very neatly illustrated in the case of smartphones, where clips and screws have basically been replaced with adhesive and adhesive with screws. Now, this trend you see here, we are seeing it not only in smartphones, but also in most tablets, laptops, headphones, and smartwatches. The second issue has to do with software, as many of you already noted on the survey. There is a trend specifically for smartphones and e-bikes to use serial numbers and proprietary software that is basically blocking third-party providers from repairing and replacing the batteries in these devices. And the third issue has to do with spare parts. We've seen that there is 
Another trend, and this one, is to change the design of the batteries every two to three years. When this happens, the old batteries, they stop being manufactured or they really decreased uh, the number of batteries put out. This is creating shortages and driving the prices up. All of these three fact factors together are um, not only making it really difficult to remove batteries and to replace them, but other components of the device will try to remove the battery. So as you would imagine, all of this is having negative implications when it comes to replacing, repairing, repurposing, and collecting both batteries and consumer electronics. And all of this together is slowing down the very much needed transition to a circular economy. The last issue I'd like to quickly touch upon is industry concern. Some manufacturers have argued and modular designs will eventually just create less durable and thicker devices and thicker devices, which is something consumers don't want. Well, we looked into the, into the issue and we found two things. The first one, we found no correlation between battery capacity and modularity. As you can see in this table, we have a list, one column with all the smartphone models, the ones highlighted in blue are modular phones, and right next to it, you can see battery capacity. There really is no difference. The second thing we found is that for those phones that already have modular batteries or easy to replace batteries, they are really, they're not bigger, they're not heavier than what's already uh, on the market for the counterparts that are fully integrated. So what's the conclusion here, really briefly? Well, the first one is that non-removable battery integration techniques, use of proprietary software, and the lack of access to spare parts is resulting in discarding batteries and devices prematurely, and also in low collection and recycling rates. And all of this together is having significant economic and environmental impacts that really need to be addressed. Okay, I'll just give a bit of an update now on what's happening at the European level. So um, already uh, Rakesh uh, introduced the, the battery regulation, which is under development. There was a proposal in December 2020, uh, which covers all different sorts of aspects uh, from due diligence, recycling uh, rates, recovery rates, uh, information labels, but particularly Article 11 is, is really, I think, what we're focused on today. Um, the first proposal from the Commission uh, looked at uh, whether or not uh, batteries should be removable and replaceable. And, and they they included a kind of uh, a specific point on this saying that portable batteries should be removable and replaceable by end users. Now we're entering the next slide, please. Uh, the next stage of the, um, of the development of the legislation. Um, if you're not familiar with how legislation is developed at the, the European level, don't worry, it's a complicated process, but the, the, the basic uh, explanation is that there are three institutions involved. And right now it's the European Parliament and the European Council who are negotiating the proposal. Um, and to roughly summarize what's happening, they are in general supporting the, the idea that batteries should be removable and replaceable by end users, but there are subtle differences in their formulation of the, the legal text. And um, we really have to wait for the outcome of, uh, of this political process to see what the, the conclusion is. Uh, we could expect uh, a legal text to be uh, adopted uh, even by the end of this year. So it's very, very interesting to see how this develops. Um, as part of the next slide, please, uh, uh, the work we are doing looking at the, the, the battery regulation, we've been communicating as part of the Right to Repair Europe campaign with uh, other environmental NGOs, but also actors in the repair and recycling uh, sector across Europe. Uh, many of them, a few of them I've seen are on the, on the call today. Great to have you here. Um, but I think there's quite a strong consensus amongst repair and uh, recycling actors to support uh, strong uh, re uh, replaceability requirements for batteries. Um, and this is really what our position is based on. So 
making batteries removable and replaceable for all in consumer electronics, including light means of transport like uh, bikes and scooters. Um, also enabling battery repair, so actually replacing the cells in large battery packs for things like uh, e-bikes, possible for professionals, independent professionals as well, and making uh, batteries available as spare parts. Also, as Mariana said, we're facing the issue of software blocks in some products. We've seen this for smartphones already, uh, notably in Apple products. We're also seeing it uh, being used to prevent uh, the repair and replacement of cells in battery packs for e-bikes. Um, so this is this is what we've uh, developed as a position. We we published a position paper, which I'll share in the chat in a second, which uh, rep is represented by around 500 organisations. Um, and I hope uh, we'll be happy to hear from any of you if you uh, are interested in supporting our work in this area. Thanks very much. Right. Um, thank you, then, uh, Mariana and John. Um, let's stay there for, for a moment. Yeah, You spoke about 500 organizations uh, representing NGOs, recyclers coming together, coming together and having one position. If you could briefly tell us uh, how it works, uh, you reach out to some of um, the like-minded organizations and tell them, hey, we are planning to work on this because of ABC reason, and then it starts rolling one by one. How does it work? How did you manage to do this? And and please tell us, uh, is it almost like a United Nations where everybody is there and then you develop a consensus? So how long did it take? How many meetings? How many hours? That's a very good uh, question, Rakesh. I would say... Um... Uh, coordinating amongst uh, NGOs, even though it has its difficulties, is quite uh, well well uh, organised. And, and I mean, the EB itself has 180 members, so uh, we we communicate with them quite regularly, and we're used to coordinating on position papers. But it's it's not that usual that we develop a joint position with uh, with industry in this way. The the main way we actually uh, got in contact for example with the recycling industry is that the the we forum which represents uh, uh waste electronic uh, recyclers in europe they published a report uh last year which was specifically looking at fires in um in recycling plants in europe and they stated in their in their report that one of their main recommendations was that products should be designed so that batteries can be more easily removed because they were facing the cost of uh, buyers and the insurance costs related to this mm. because they couldn't easily remove the, the batteries in products which were going through waste facilities. We read this and we said, okay, maybe we have actually something in common with them. And that's how we, we got in contact with, uh, with the recycling industry and, and they supported our position on this topic. So I think we realized that we had something in common that the fact yeah. that batteries were being designed in a way that they were difficult to remove was actually yeah. something which was causing a problem for us. And the same with the repair community. When Mariana developed the, the study, we we actually started with a survey, which we sent out mm. to, well, in the end, I think we had 200 responses from independent repairers who said, yeah, we're actually struggling with products which have batteries glued into them. It's wasting our time. Sometimes we're damaging the product. So ultimately we're losing money. So this is why the, these different actors kind of saw the value in, in this Article 11 we've been talking about. Okay. And, and I have two other questions here. Um, apart from Europe, would you be open if uh, a recycler or a waste aggregator in India or Shenzhen or Hong Kong is reaching out to you all and saying, hey, uh, we've also had issues. We've been able to overcome some of them, but uh, we want to work together and learn and contribute. Would you accept or is it limited only to European members? Not at all. I'd be, I'd be happy to hear, hear from anyone, okay. much like the, the United Nations you, uh, you refer to, Rakesh. Okay. And now the final comment. Yeah? Next week, Mariana, as you know, is International Women's Day. So best wishes for that uh, in advance for the 8th of March. But uh, John Pierre, I think you want to make a short intervention when you saw the lineup and uh, the panelists, uh, you have some strong beliefs, yeah? Um, and now is the time to, 
for sharing. Oh, uh, yes. Time. Thanks. Thanks. Thanks, Rakesh. Yeah, no, no, no. Actually, I, I wanted to apologize because um, it wasn't me that noticed this. It was actually one of my my colleagues and she she pointed out to me when the original uh, agenda for the meeting was uh, presented she said well hey this isn't this isn't that good because it's just a uh, mano i think they call it when there's only men uh, speaking on on the panel and i have to be honest i hadn't noticed this myself and um and but i realized she was completely right so that's when I, I spoke to you rakesh and said that actually we should try to fix gender balance on the panel and Mariana, who was actually the brains behind the, the study, and uh, it's great that she was able to join us here today, and she does a better job of presenting it than me anyway. So thanks for yeah. raising this, Rakesh. Yeah. Thank you, Mariana. And thanks to Mariana as well. Thank you, thank you Rakesh, for, for acknowledging that. I don't know if there is gender balance on the panel, <laughs> but it's, uh, it's good to have uh, in Well, I think there is. There is, because Jean-Pierre just mentioned that you were the brains behind the study, so just by the weight yeah. of the technical competence you brought in, I'm sure there is balance, yeah? So thank you. Um, all right, now on one hand, we of course hear uh, from the perspective of NGOs and, and recyclers and repair organizations, which are an important stakeholder, but at the same time, we are talking of products. These are designed by uh, engineers, by different brands um, that have of course put in a lot of effort in and thinking what's the right design based on the target market. So at this stage, it will be useful to hear from uh, Mr. Christian Eckert. He's uh, the environmental policy leader at ZWI and also leads uh, activities for the battery division. Uh, you, of course, represent so many different manufacturers who have so many different products, diverse designs, and many of them, of course, have uh, batteries. Uh, can you share with us um, uh, a background on how did your members look at the draft regulation? What are the areas where you still see uh, have some concern and what recommendations do you have and, and what plans you have? Mm -hmm. So, hello everybody, you can hear me? Yes. Yeah, thank you. So, hello, also from my side, uh, it's a pleasure to be here today. Yeah, it's why it's, it's a, the association, the German Association of uh, Electronic, Electric and Digital Industries. But we are, of course, from, for, from our history, we represent German industries. But, but today we, are, we have international members, so all the worldwide acting, um, or many worldwide acting manufacturers are there. And uh, we represent um, as well uh, manufacturers of batteries, but also many of, com of the companies who are using batteries. And um, well, it's not always, that's an advantage on one side because we can combine the different players and also can bring together the different views. But on the other side, sometimes it's not so easy to find a common position because a battery manufacturer from the beginning has maybe a, dif a different view than the one who's only using a battery. And that's our task to bring, uh, well, at bring manufacturers together uh, and to find uh, common solutions. Um, so, but that's, that's not always easy. We have 1,600 members. Not all are uh, using batteries, but it's getting more and more. Okay. Uh, so maybe if you can uh, take the next uh, eight, 10 minutes and uh, yeah. share with us a little bit. Of course. Mm -hmm. So um, let's check it. So is the, so it's now in, in the presentation mode. So is it, yeah. can you see it? Perfect. So, um, well, we are, uh, as the, the um, previous presentation uh, showed, um, we are now in the middle of discussions of the battery regulation uh, uh, on the European level. And um, given the fact that it is a complex issue, I focused um, on some, some issues uh, and that's mostly related um, on safety of batteries. Um, and uh, I hope that will be a, a good um, 
uh, well, a good uh, contribution to this discussion. Um, I will focus on two points. Um, one point is the reviewability of portal batteries, things that already have been discussed and that are in, well, mainly in discussion when we speak about the battery regulation. But uh, from our point of view, an, an, an even or a thing that is has nearly the same or the same uh, relevance is the removability of individual battery cells from battery packs. So for instance, for e-bikes or uh, home storage. And so, and I start with that and without going into much detail, given the fact I only have eight minutes, um, I only want to say that first, we sh should be clear what we're talking about. Um, the, the, the difficulty in the current discussion is that everybody speaks about repairability, reusability, and at the end, many people uh, understand completely different uh, things uh, under those buzzwords. From our point of view, when we look at the removability of cells, let's say from a battery pack, then it's really crucial to um, make those differentiations because a, a reuse of a certain battery is something completely different from remanufacturing because when you are using something again, then then you are not uh, entering the the battery management, the the, the, the well the, the product itself. And of course, that should be uh, possible uh, in the future. Uh, also, repurposing or refurbishing um, that should uh, of course be possible, and it, in in many cases is possible today. Where we come into a more complex issue is remanufacturing. Um, in, the, in the event when you are, let's say, entering the battery pack and changing things in a pack, then um, at the end, the certification is void. And as I will show in the next slides, then we also have some um, security and safety issues. So, um, when we look um, at the technical ba background of such a battery pack, take a pack from an e-bike or, or also from a from a from home storage uh, better battery packs, then um, you usually have a pack with a, a large number of cells, um, and usually they are welded or bonded together. Um, that means it is not always easy to exchange single cells. For instance, they are, they are mo main, mostly not screwed. So exchanging is really a problem. Um, that means when you are trying to exchange a, a single cell that might cause um, destructions of, cer of certain structures of the pack. Then you also have thermal cell connection. So for the thermal management, you have connections of different cells uh, that can't be can't be always uh, removed that easily. And if you remove it, then it's difficult to put it together. So that's also uh, has to be taken into account. A, a fourth point is um, some, some, in some applications, the cells are pressurized. That's really to enlarge the lifetime. Um, so, and if you open such a pack, that means that you depressurize it, and it might be very difficult to put it in the in the original state again. That means that the pack won't um, uh, work anymore in the same way, um, or um, if it's not repressurized, that maybe the lifetime of the remaining cells will not uh, as long as uh, predicted, and. Um, Last point on the technical background is uh, when you have a pack and you put in a new cell that probably won't work with the old cells that remain in the pack. So usually uh, cells should have the same age to work uh, probably together. So that are some 
technical backgrounds. Um, and now I come to the, the, the main issue um, uh, when we look about exchangeability of, um, of uh, cells. As soon as you um, open um, such a pack, then in most cases, it, it loses its um, status of status of tested, and for instance, won't be possible to be transport anymore. So, for instance, last week we had a discussion with our uh, national uh, ministry of transport, and they, they raised that topic that when you uh, work with battery packs, you should also always be sure that these, uh, after treating such a pack, it doesn't lose the, its, its um, status of tested. Or if there is a change, then you have to test it again. But there are some criteria to be met. It's, it's a really tr uh, complex issue. I don't want to go into detail of that, but it's really an issue to, to, to take into account that there are um, important safety issues when uh, changing cells from a pack. Um, so that means um, when usually when you look at uh, battery packs, um, these packs are designed for a long lifespan. Um, and if there should be a, um, exchangeability, we um, vote for the exchangeability of modules. So if you have a module of, let's say, 10 cells, of course, that you can exchange, but taking the module and then take out one cell and put another in, there we have serious doubts that this will met, meet the, uh, well, UN, at least the UN uh, safety requirements for batteries. That's the point for um, removability of uh, cells from battery packs. And now I'll, I want to go um, more briefly to the point of um, batteries from, well, portable batteries, that's the thing we are mostly discussing about. Um, of course, there should be the possibility to, um, to, to, to remove. Um, but you also have to be to take into account that also there are safety issues. For instance, if you have uh, devices that are, come into contact with dust or heat or water, then of course, after, also after repairing, it should be secured that it meets the safety requirements. And because if it is not, um, uh, taken back to the same status, then uh, the, the, the device can be destroyed uh, when, uh, for instance, when uh, water comes inside. So also there, we are not saying repair or exchangeability uh, of batteries should not be the case, but here in the discussion, especially in the European batteries regulation, we say, well, it should be replaceable in, 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 in most cases, either by a qualified operator or the end user. But as soon as there are safety risks, it should be a qualified operator and not everybody, um, a private person should be in, in, in the, should have the probability to uh, make this exchange uh, of batteries. So that's, some brief comments on that, really focused on the safety issues. I hope this uh, uh, is fruitful for the discussion. And yeah, if there are questions, feel free. Thank you very much for sharing those perspectives and picking up those specific cases uh, um, that, of course, are um, currently possible and have to be addressed. Uh, I'm curious, though. Um, on one hand, we saw the voting result of the NV committee on Article 11. So how is the feeling within um, your member base? Are they now exploring alternative ways in parallel and looking at design options? Or are they going to do a wait and watch approach until the legal text is out? Well, I mean, now we are in the, I mean, 
it's another two to three weeks, or we expect both the vote from the Council of Member States and also from the Parliament, let's say end of March, mm -hmm. something like that. Mm -hmm. Or if it is April, then it's April. Yeah. So I wouldn't say that someone is now starting a, a completely new way of thinking about it. So we, mm -hmm. the manufacturers, of course, know what's discussed. And mm -hmm. uh, it might, it will be interesting to see what, what Parliament and Council will say. Then mm -hmm. we will have to try look uh, with together with the Commission. Uh, and by the end of the year, most likely we will have the um, the, the new uh, regulation. Um, and because it is, I mean, when when we will have new requirements for let's say removability. Um, that will also um, cause design changes. And mm -hmm. for that, uh, the manufacturers at least some need some time. Yeah? The, mm -hmm. in, in the proposals, there are, well, there are proposals, for instance, two years uh, of, of time to be prepared for mm -hmm. uh, certain um, uh, proposals. So that mm -hmm. means, they are aware of the fact they are, you know, what's discussed. They, they, they mm. are part of the discussion. Uh, but uh, when there is a regulation, for sure, they need some time to adapt to certain uh, changes mm. there might be. Yeah. OK. All right. Thank you. Now, ha having heard from uh, the outcome of the research and then looked at what um, uh, an industry association is bringing forward in in terms of uh, real safety aspects that have to be addressed, whether it be about design or, or overall safety. Um, and we also heard that point about an operator, technical operator. Let's, let's hear from uh, Kyle. Kyle, you, your organization and your partners globally uh, focus of course on, on the topic of repair. At the same time, you have a position on battery packs and uh, replacing individual batteries and looking at how and what are the measures that can be taken uh, that can make any consumer like a technical operator. So, so if you can take the next 10, 12 minutes and share with us uh, the perspective from your side, from the repair angle. Yeah. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, excited to, um, this is a, this is a great panel. Um, uh, some, you know, context and background on I fix it. If you're not familiar, uh, we are a global online repair community. Our mission is to teach everybody to fix all of their things. Um, and, and we figure if we can make it easy for people to share what they know, um, then it will be uh, straightforward for more people to fix their things. Um, this is what one of our repair guides look like. So this is putting a new uh, battery. This is a lithium pouch battery in a, in a thermostat. Uh, it's relatively new that thermostats have lithium batteries. And so this is the new world that we're in and, and how do we, how do we prepare for that? Um, and I think, I think I'm uh, preaching to the choir when I, when I talk about how we need to transition from a linear economy where we're tossing things away um, to a circular economy where we're fixing things and making them last longer. And uh, it's really critical as we think about this, that we focus on batteries first and foremost. Uh, when we look at, at repair scoring, we prioritize critical components. Um, the, I, I tend to think of a battery uh, more as a consumable or a wear item than a repair necessarily. Uh, if you think about a car, you're going to change the tires regularly. With a smartphone or a thermostat, you need to change the battery regularly. Um, the, you have the broader right to repair movement, which provides some kind of you know, political force on this. Uh, this is the New York Times saying, hey, why can't we change the batteries in our phones? Um, you've got the BBC coming out and saying, hey, you know, products should have a repairability rating. Um, and so when we look at design for repair principles, uh, at least with a smartphone, the thing that all of us have in our pockets all the time, uh, the priority components that we want to focus on generally are the screen and the battery, and then we can, we can talk about other components after that. Uh, and the French index uh, uh, prioritizes this very well. Um, it's a great, uh, it, it's a great index. Uh, the uh, French uh, NGO HOP uh, just released a report looking at a year uh, in the world with the French index being out there. Um, and overall, I think it's really been successful. This is the Pixel 6 scorecard. 
By the way, I get asked a lot because I fix it has been scoring products for well over a decade. What's the similarities or differences between the French index and the iFixit index? Um, the iFixit index is mostly focused on criterion one and two um, and does not factor in criterions three uh, and four availability and pricing of spare parts. So that's where you'll see it's maybe a difference in the total outcome. Well, the iFixit scorecard tends to focus a little bit more on the mechanical disassembly of products. Um, uh, including accessing and replacing the battery. Um, and and uh, again, just to kind of set the tone before we dive into battery specific safety, um, uh, the French index is out there changing consumer behavior and making people care about battery replacements. So you've got 86% of French consumers saying that the index is impacting their purchasing behavior. 80% would switch from their favorite brand for a more repairable product. So people want to be able to swap out their batteries. Um, the other thing that I would mention is traditionally, there's been lots of conversations around warranties. And within the US context specifically, um, uh, you cannot legally void a consumer's warranty if they open their product, uh, as long as they don't damage it in the process. Um, and speaking of people doing it, I was just looking at random YouTube videos yesterday. Um, You've got 4.8 million people looking at a video on how to replace your iPhone 5 battery in two minutes. Uh, so whether we like it or not, these battery replacements are happening by consumers at vast scale. <laughs> this is just a random sampling of videos. Um, <coughs> so when I look at it, I, I think you know, if, if we're going to build a circular economy, if we're going to build a sustainable electronics industry, we have to focus on enabling repair. We have to focus on uh, you know, building brand loyalty around long lasting products. And that starts with the consumable, right? So you're seeing Apple starting to, to uh, change their stance. They've come out and said they're gonna be making parts including batteries available directly to consumers uh, later this year. Um, we just uh, made an announcement with, with Valve. They have this cool new uh, handheld game console and they're going to be selling parts including batteries. We're gonna be working with them on that. Uh, we also have a partnership with Motorola where we've been selling batteries direct to consumers for years, including a repair kit. Um, so this is kind of what that looks like. Uh, you, so you can buy a, uh, a battery with all the tools and everything to do it. So let's talk uh, kind of the meat of what I wanted to get to is talking about how do we do this safely. iFixit has over 8 million consumers a month on iFixit learning how to do repairs. <laughs> and we take very, very seriously uh, achieving success and safe outcomes for those consumers. Um, so that really starts with training people. <laughs> uh, we want to take people from, from a path where they, they have no uh, you know, uh, experience doing a repair to being able to do it, uh, the repair both, both uh, safely and successfully uh, the first time. Uh, and that involves detailed training documentation. This is probably what I've spent my life doing is writing and training people on how to repair things. Um, here's an example of a device where uh, you have four screws that are all different lengths. And if you install the screws incorrectly, you can damage the device. You're not gonna cause a safety problem, but you're gonna, you're gonna harm the device. Uh, and so providing people with that information is essential because if you walk into this and you swap out those four screws, put them back not realizing that there's a 3.7 millimeter screw and a 3.1 millimeter screw, um, uh, you can instantly cause damage. So that the, the training information and the step-by-step -step repair procedures are really critical. Uh, one reason that I fix it uh, guides are visual, that we have both photos and text is to make them work for people in different language contexts. Uh, some people learn in different ways. Uh, so we're always looking at these instructions and saying, if you remove the photo, can people follow it successfully? If you remove the text, can people follow it successfully? Um, we are constantly iterating and focusing on, on the safety aspect of the instructions. And so here are, uh, I just took one of our battery guides at random and pulled out some of the safety training information that's available inside that guide. Um, uh, in this particular case, you have a stretch release adhesive that you have to remove, um, and, and you have to actually heat the device a little bit in order to remove the battery safely. Um, so you're going to find this in any, uh, any, any training context. Anytime you're, you're training anyone to do a repair, whether it's a consumer or a professional, you have to, the, the quality of the information, the quality of the training 
is really important. And, and so that's really been our focus is if, if consumers are going to be replacing things, uh, how do we how can we provide them with the best possible information to have a successful outcome? Um, here's some of our information on how to manage swollen batteries. This is something uh, probably most uh, products that have a battery, the battery is going to swell at some point. Uh, and I think that this is an area where manufacturers have actually opened themselves up to a lot of liability by not providing consumers with information on what do I do if I buy a smartphone and in three years the battery swells? How do I dispose of that smartphone? Right now, I feel like everyone is kind of ignoring that situation, but it's a very real thing that happens. So I think probably all of us have had a battery that swelled at some point. Um, and then, you know, all the way through to reinstallation um, uh, and, and getting the battery kind of precisely aligned. So if I can leave you with kind of one takeaway, it's consumers are replacing batteries themselves, uh, whether we like it or not. If we want to maximize safety and minimize incidents, we need to focus on training. We need to focus on the information that we're providing to people. And it needs to be as widely distributed as possible, or people will be uh, performing these battery swaps uh, incorrectly. Um, we, uh, we, with our Motorola partnership, we did a bunch of customer kind of uh, uh, assessments after the fact. So this was asking people, um, we, we, we talked to 140 people that had done a, a display or battery swap on a phone. These are very complex repairs. And we said, hey, how technically sophisticated are you? You can see it was all over the map. And then how satisfied were you with the outcome afterwards? This is the impact of having successful detailed training guides. Um, the, the no's here, by the way, uh, were a lot of people that hadn't actually started the repair yet. Um, and then how difficult was it? I would rate the repairs that these folks were doing as very difficult. Uh, so it shows that once you have information, once you have a procedure, you can, you can succeed. I think probably a lot of people would say that something Ikea furniture is difficult too, but once you have the instructions, it gets easier. Um, so here's kind of overall customer satisfaction with the process. Um, so with that, I will pass it back over to Rakesh, but I wanted to just leave you with the idea that consumer, we're successfully helping hundreds of thousands of people do these repairs a month. Uh, we do it safely, but, but it do, it's not by accident. It's, it's through like detailed intention and, and systematically providing uh, uh, in, uh, training information, providing step-by-step -step procedures and providing safety uh, processes, um, no matter what happens along the way. Thanks. Thanks, Kyle. Kyle, I have a question. Um, I can't recollect now, but in how many languages are these repair training instructions available today? And do you have plans to add more languages? I fix it in 12 languages. Uh, and then okay. uh, everything that is on iFixit is licensed under Creative Commons. So people okay. can translate it and, and republish it on their own sites if they want. So we have folks in other communities, uh, you know, copy and paste it and translate it into, um, you know, Imbale is a language in Africa we've seen some folks translate into. Okay. And, and one more question is, while of course it's uh, relevant to talk about smartphones, because I'm sure all of us have one or some of us have maybe more than one. Uh, we also saw reports of the benefits of just increasing one year lifetime, extending lifetime overall in terms of reductions on emissions and so on. But apart from smartphones, uh, what are the other products where you have seen uh, the strong desire of the uh, community, iFixit community, with regards to replacing battery? Uh, how about toys? How about some other products with integrated batteries? Which are the products that come to your mind? Well, the products where the battery sees the most heavy intensive use so, so that they need to be swapped out regularly. So I would say after that, probably uh, headphones, wireless headsets, um, mm. some products like, like the Apple AirPods are designed where it's not possible to replace the battery. So we get demand and we can't help people. Where Samsung's mm. Galaxy Buds, the battery is replaceable. So we see that being popular, um, you know, handheld game consoles. But, but yeah, the, the, the need to replace the battery is proportionate to mm. the use of the number of cycles mm. that you put on it. So I would say smartphones and then laptops and then and mm. then headphones and then we look at you know, some other categories like toys. Okay, thanks Kyle. And thank you for that example of uh, training and, and how you're supporting the community. Now, having looked at those perspectives, Jason, uh, we saw of course the research, we saw what industry associations are putting forward in terms of safety aspect that should be looked at. 
we saw about some examples so now how it's being done it's possible you said jason everything is possible but safety first so can you share um, an overview of what you have experienced with all the batteries that you have looked at and how they are integrated within products and what from your perspective is a way to ensure a process where the consumer is able to safely replace and what aspects should be looked after or taken care of so jason if you can compress your experience of the past decade into 10 12 minutes uh, and and walk us through sure um can you see my screen now yes okay hi uh, everyone uh, uh, this is jason from two and shenzhen office uh very pleasure to be here and uh, my part is about how to ensure the safety on battery replacement by users from the perspective of technical and uh, standard requirements. So we'll cover four topics here. Uh, the first, I'd like to int introduce the battery types and what kind of batteries are related with safety concerns for the replacement. And uh, then the potential risks for users to replace batteries and the third part is about the standard requirements for battery replacement. And then the last is about how to ensure the safety during replacement. Uh, there are many types of batteries we use in our daily life with various safety and performance characteristics due to different chemical system inside. But generally we can um, classify them into two categories. The first is the primary batteries, also called uh, non-rechargeable batteries. And the other one is, of course, rechargeable batteries. Uh, most of primary batteries here are allowed to be re replaced by users. You can easily find them in convenience store or supermarkets. I bet you all have ever bought these icon batteries or coin batteries because they are quite safe. Uh, with aqueous electro electrolyte, not likely to catch fire, Ex except this battery here. Uh, however, they are typically intended for industrial applications, so common users may never touch them. And uh, for rechargeable ones, there are three types that widely be used. First is the nickel system, and then lead acid batteries, and the lithium ion batteries. The first two are normally allowed to be handled by users because they are also quite safe. Uh, and uh, for lithium ion batteries with different shapes, uh, cylindrical and uh, prismatic with metal case and polymer tap with flexible case. And now also uh, many small electronic uh, equipment like wireless earbuds were used this type of coin type of rechargeable batteries. Uh, the safety concerns regarding the, re the replacement we're talking here will focus on lithium ion batteries, as we all know that it's more likely to catch fire or explosion and more dangerous than other types. However, uh, lithium ion battery is still the best option we have to power the portable devices like mobile phone, tablet, tablet, as well as big ones like electrical vehicles, because it can provide more power with lighter in weight compared with other batteries. About uh, 15 or 20 years ago, many lithium ion batteries were allowed to be replaced by users. You can easily open the uh, real case of a mobile phone and take out the batteries. Because these lithium, lithium batteries have rigid metal case to prevent from damage. Why now to make the uh, electronic products thinner and lighter, uh, like small smartphone? Uh, polymer batteries have taken place of the prismatic batteries. Uh, the battery in chloro here is a flexible polymer layer with thickness only about 
80 to 120 micrometers, which can't provide sufficient mechanical protection. So these batteries are normally designed to be embedded and not accessible to users. It needs to rely on the product case for the mechanical protection. Replace these um, batteries requires multiple tools and complex procedures. And uh, improper handling during the replacement may lead to some accidents. For example, uh, this is an accident happened last year in China. Uh, a customer took his mobile phone to a surface store for battery replacement. Although the serviceman has uh, warned him that not to touch the removed battery, but the customer may be just curious, still took on it and tried to bend it and then the batteries were on fire immediately. Uh, the second uh, accident shown here happened last month when trying to remove the battery from the mobile phone. The serviceman accidentally punctured the battery with his tools, the tweezers. Then the battery started to smoke and turned out to fire later. If such an uh, accident can happen on a skilled and experienced person, it will surely bring more risks for common users. Here we list some potential risks and the consequences if users trying to uh, replace the batteries. Uh, the first is the external short circuits. This is the most common case, I think. Uh, when, you, when, when, when they try to take out the batteries, uh, metal tools can easily connect the positive and negative polarity which uh, will cause temperature rise and even fire or explosion. And uh, internal short circuit may not be well known, but actually it's quite common and dangerous also. The positive and negative electrode inside the battery was isolated by the separator when thickness only about 10 micrometer. External force on the surface of the polymer battery, even a uh, single press by a fingernail could easily damage the separator and cause the internal short circuit, which can lead to obvious voltage drop, swell, and uh, fire or even explosion. And uh, also leakage can occur when the battery enclosure were damaged, which can cause further corrosion of battery case. Also, the electrolytes bit out will hurt skin and eyes if get direct contact. Allow users to replace batteries means they have more chances to handle batteries and even store batteries for a long time at home. If the batteries were, uh, were stored at some extreme conditions like high temperature, the battery can swell. If the batteries was kept for a long time without regular recharging them, uh, that will be a problem also. I guess you all have used cameras. Uh, then some of you may have ever seen the batteries swelled uh, when not used camera for several months. The, so this is the reason. Overcharge and over discharge can occur when the production circuit was damaged. And also uh, each battery was designed to be used in specified range of uh, conditions such as temperature, current and voltage and even the thickness uh, change ratio during charging and discharging. So different type of batteries may count for the condition of the same product. Then there will, there will also be some, some more problems. And uh, defective batteries removed from equipment may not in a stable or safe condition. Handling these um, batteries requires certain technology and uh, qualifications and, and also special tools. Users may get hurt or cause accidents. Uh, and when replacing the battery, damage to the equipment may occur, which can cause greater electronic waste. To reduce the risk and prevent injury to customer, many battery or device uh, standard specified requirements on battery replacement. Uh, for example, your 1642 uh, specify that loose cells shall not be replaced by user users. 
cells here means that this single uh, chemical unit that without any protection circuit or lead wires. It also sent some um, invitations for user replacement batteries, but trained people defined as technician can replace all types. These two standards specify that cells shall be protected with rigid casing to prevent users contact directly. And uh, of course, instructions shall be provided to users. IEC 62368-1 is the safety standard for IT products like mobile phone and laptop, also audio video products. It requires the, that the battery must be designed as reverse battery polarity is prevented. Also, uh, it should also uh, can avoid uh, the, all the accidents that may hurt people during the replacement process. And these two standards are for battery operated mobile phone and laptop respectively. It defines that embedded battery shall be as the tap that's not replaced by users. And also only tested and certified batteries are allowed to be used as the spray batteries. I think if the uh, industry are moving forward to allow users to replace the batteries, I believe, I believe there are many um, aspects that we need to consider to reduce potential risks as well as to comply with the standards and the regulations. The first is to update the design of the battery and the electronic products. You may add an additional rigid but thin layer to enforce the mechanical robustness of polymer battery, although it could lead to some battery capacity loss, of course. And also the device shall be designed as can be opened by user with some uh, basic tools easily to remove and assemble new batteries. And also a uh, detailed manual shall be provided to, to user. Uh, as we discussed, uh, many standards send some, uh, set some uh, limitations or even don't allow for user to replace. But uh, uh, the standards also allow trained people to do that. So another path is that we can train common users to skill persons so they can operate it by themselves. However, uh, this may require many detailed te technical trainings to end users. For example, they need to know how to identify the correct battery type, so how much the batteries want to be used. Also, uh, they need the knowledge of battery safety characteristics, so pot potential risks can be prevented. And uh, the construction of the end device shall be trained also then the device won't be damaged. And also the most important, they shall also be trained on the procedure to remove the old and uh, assemble new batteries. The removed batteries shall be stored and transferred properly. And uh, the correct tools shall be provided and trained. Uh, also, they need to know the correct uh, personal protective equipment if necessary. Last but not least, we definitely don't like to see a replacement burn a house or hurt people. So they should know how to respond when abnormal conditions like small, a smoke, fire, explosion have occurred. Although this is not all, that we need to do, I believe, with the efforts from all related parties in the industry and also consumers, uh, the goal of safety replacement by users can be achieved. So thank you. Right. Thank you, Jason, for, for sharing those uh, specific uh, safety risks, but also ways on how to address those risks with links to technical standards. Yeah. Thank you for yeah. sharing the perspective. Now. Having heard um, from our uh, experts here, from the perspective of research conducted uh, via academia, via repair organizations, from industry associations, from repair organizations, from uh, technical evaluation organizations, um, what next? Where should we go next? So 
if you can please share your feedback via this next poll question um what, what do you feel should uh, be the next step do you feel that by default batteries in all products must be replaceable and removable based on what you've seen uh, do you feel that all the manufacturers must provide uh, technical information for the end user to safely replace batteries that's what uh, we saw as an example what Kyle had mentioned but we saw also from uh, not but and we also saw from Jason what kind of detailed technical information should be provided and in addition to us talking specifically about uh, how it should reflect based on the proposed battery regulation do you feel that greater effort should be put in place so that uh, there is better harmonization of requirements that potentially will come up in uh, us or, or in china or in india or other country and uh, if you think that something else should happen next then please type your answer via the uh, chat box so our uh, our colleagues are able to have a look at it and also reflect on it so ryan we have about 60% of the audience has uh, responded let's give it 5 more seconds and then let's uh, have a look at the results yeah all right so um looking at the results we see that uh, it's it's very close we see on one hand the perspective is that by default all products must have replaceable and removable batteries and almost uh, equally that manufacturers must provide technical information to the end user but at the same time there should be greater harmonization with regards to the regulatory requirements and and mandates in europe uh, with uh, american lawmakers um, lawmakers in china policy makers in china india and so on to to ease the pain of manufacturers uh, overall um with those answers i would like to now request if we can have a, some sort of a reflection both on what you have heard so far um, from our fellow panelists but also in terms of the feedback that uh, our audience has provided so how about we start with you uh, mariana based on what you've heard from uh, industry perspective from repair perspective from the perspective of a technical um, testing house certifier and uh, also from the feedback from audience to the poll uh, do you feel outraged about something or do you feel optimistic that we are going in the right direction i would say both uh, you know i think that the battery regulation makes me optimistic the parliament report where they're pushing for you know better repairability removability really thinking about the life cycle of the battery is definitely a step in the right direction but then there's that frustration to see the pushback uh, you know a lot of yes but right now it's it's hard and it it can't be done and there's kind of this from my point of view uh, a very narrow view on like oh is this just right now there's safety issues and i wish the conversation was about how do we redesign batteries because listen batteries are here to stay we didn't mention this but the projection for consumer electronics alone is that the market is going to grow 60% uh, you know in in 10 years and this is not even mentioning or thinking about small mobility or vehicles so we need to stop thinking about these little things and just go broader we need to redesign batteries uh, they need to be better for the environment they need to be removable and replaceable so i think uh, the the issues are real and i think i heard very loudly there are some real concerns but i don't think any of them uh, cannot be addressed i mean just think about and just really briefly that i'll finish with this but think about the uh, cafe regulation in the united states uh, you know back in the 80s they were trying to say how many miles uh, you need to your car needs to run per um, liter of gallon of fuel uh, mm -hmm. and when they did that the entire industry was completely overwhelmed they said it was going to cost them a lot they were going to lose a lot of money and you know what happened they realized that uh, they added a filter that cost costed $25 and it was fixed and it saved so much money in health and environmental issues and it's brought better quality of life to california mm -hmm. so with that said i think uh, But there's a lot that we can do and uh, and we should be focusing on those solutions okay thanks mariana then john pierre you were also sharing your perspective during the circular economy stakeholder forum the past couple of days based on what you heard there 
based on what you've heard from our fellow panelists and based on the response from the audience to the question on what they feel should happen next. Do you feel outraged? Do you feel optimistic? Uh, do you have some other reflections? I'd love to uh, follow Mariana's uh, good intervention. Um, there's two, two maybe points I would like to pick up on, which um, kind of came out from the question and answer and the comments people were posting, because I'd like to reply to the audience a little bit. One of them is about battery pack uh, repair, replacing the cells in, uh, in battery packs. Um, a lot of people saying, A, this isn't safe, and B, um, there's no value in doing this. Really, I mean, during the process of uh, developing the report, we spoke to a lot of uh, bike uh, battery pack repairers, and there's there's many of these companies now in Europe, and they were giving many good examples of why you would do this. In some cases, the battery pack was no longer available from the bike manufacturer. You couldn't buy it. So if you couldn't replace the cells in the battery pack, the bike was unrideable and you had to uh, replace the whole bike. In some cases, there was just a small switch which was damaged and actually you would get a lot more life out of that battery pack by just replacing something small on the board and doing a small repair. And I think these kind of things are often overlooked by saying, okay, it's too dangerous to open up the battery pack, but there are professionals doing this and they have viable businesses already. So why should we deny them that, especially if we can save resources? The other point, I think it's made very clearly by Manfred from uh, ERA, and it's the opposite side of the safety question, and I tried to raise this, but there are real safety uh, issues happening right now in recycling uh, facilities across, uh, well, definitely in Europe, but I imagine across the world, where we are having fires started because there are batteries left in products, or that are very difficult to remove from products, and they are causing millions of euros or, or dollars if you like in damage in in reality and this is happening today and i'm not saying that there isn't a real risk for user replacement of batteries but there is a real risk actually from having non-replaceable batteries too and um it's good to balance this perspective and i think this is why mariana's point that we need to put for solutions to all these issues is is, is really the correct uh, perspective Thanks again, uh, Rakesh and TV for organizing this today. It was a, it was a great, uh, a great event. Thanks, John. Now, so, uh, how about you, Mr. Christian Eckert? Um, either if you have a reflection on what you've heard uh, so far from our fellow panelists or the kind of questions or chat messages, and also on um, the feedback provided by uh, the audience uh, for the final uh, poll question. Uh, how are you feeling? What what I what's your thought process at the moment? Any reflections that you'd like to share? Um, Ryan, is it just me, or are we not able he to? He just got back. We uh, need to ask him again. Okay. Uh, uh, Christian, were you okay? I, I wanted to ask you based on what you heard from our fellow panelists and uh, the type of questions and chat messages and the final poll question. Do you have some reflections and, and how you're feeling at the moment uh, from the position of uh, the industry association? Yeah, uh, sorry, sorry for for being away for half a minute. No problem. So um, yeah. I mean, today for me it was definitely very interesting to to see the different views. Um, I mean, for the, when when we discuss for the moment uh, for the battery regulation on the European level, it's more discussion, of course, with representatives of ministries and 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 parliament and and things like that. So it's not not like a stakeholder consultation. Uh, and so um, it, here. The, Came the different perspectives, and I think uh, everybody has fair points. And the, the crucial thing is that, uh, well, th there will be a combination of the different views with the at the end uh, with a good uh, result, where we say, well, there is what are possibilities to remove batteries, but we also have to take into account the different things like safety and other things. Um, that we don't get uh, results that uh, might be dangerous. So all in all, I think it's, it's good to have such an exchange. And now we will see what the legislator will, will do with all that. 
Okay, got it. Thank you. And how about you, Jason? Uh, how do you feel? You, of course, are, uh, I think, uh, starting again your day tomorrow, looking at products with batteries and, and batteries overall, uh, having looked at and heard uh, the different perspectives and risks and possibilities and desires and the feedback from the audience. Next time, when you are part of a technical committee of standard development, uh, whether it's on China level or so on, will you try to make sure and convince that there should be greater harmonization of standards um, between the countries? Yeah, 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 sure. Um, uh, although um, there are still many um, challenges and the risks, especially on the on the safety concerns about uh, the re replacement. But I still uh, believe that we need to move this forward to next step, uh, because uh, not only to uh, reduce the uh, the pollution, but also uh, to um, recycle the materials in the batteries. Because uh, as we all know that actually the materials in batteries are limited in this planet. Mm -hmm. um, for example, the cobalt, the nickel nickel materials, the prices of these materials are keep rising these years. So uh, this is also a way to to protect, protect the planet. Uh, okay. Although we 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 got many things to do, we got many problems to solve, but I think uh, the battery manufacturer and the end product manufacturer and also all the consumers have the motive to to move this to the to the next step. Yeah. Got it. Then I, I want to say thank you also to, to all of our panelists for taking the time for being active and responding to many of the chat messages and Q&A messages. Uh, what we are going to do is we're going to make a summary of all those questions, have all of them answered. Uh, I want to thank, of course, our audience and participants who are joining us uh, in some cases quite late uh, for being there, for being active. And to all the experts and the representatives of the panel, thank you for taking the time. Thank you for sharing your wisdom um, and your experience. And to Ryan, thank you for making sure that everything works. Uh, we'll, of course, continue this conversation over emails and calls and uh, perhaps some posts. And uh, we look forward to exchanging further until we see the final legal text of the battery regulation. Thank you then for joining. Uh, take care. All the best until later. Bye. Thank you, everyone. Bye. 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 Bye.